Good morning. The first business, first item of business today is general questions. And we start with question number one from Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government under what circumstances an NHS board would limit the amount of necessary operations that a patient requires due to budgetary circumstance, concerns. Sorry. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Uh, no clinically necessary operation should be curtailed because of budgetary or financial concerns. Funding for NHS borders will increase to 207.7 million, a 44.8% increase in real terms since 2006-07. Uh, and in addition, NHS borders will receive 987,000 uh, to target specialities such as ophthalmology and radiology as part of the first tranche of funding to reduce waiting times. Michelle Ballantyne. Uh, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. I was contacted by a constituent who had been referred and uh, been through the whole process and put on the waiting list for a double hip operation. He was contacted and asked if he would be willing to go to the Go Golden Jubilee Hospital to have his treatment, which he agreed to. I have to say it was very good, very successful, he's very happy. Except that they could only do one hip at a time, which we know clinically is, is the approach. But when he went to his 12-week assessment and asked, and when, when will it be admitted for the next hip, he was told there is no plans to do your other hip, you have to go back to the beginning and start again. So the question is not about him actually, he's, but he's concerned. When he tried to find out why um, NHS Lothian, as it was, um, had not approved having both hips done, which is the treatment he was referred for, why that was done, the only whisper he could get back was the only budget that was allocated was for one hip. And that does raise some concerns, and I wondered if the Cabinet Secretary could give some assurance for people who are facing that, that that is not what they're going to experience. Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, thank you. I'm grateful to uh, Ms Ballantyne. If I could ask her to actually email me with some of that detail, then I can look specifically at that issue. I'm pleased your constituent did have his first operation and that that went well. It doesn't make uh, sense to me what you've told me doesn't make sense uh, and doesn't sound correct either but if you would care to send me the detail then I will happily look at that and as soon as I have an answer uh, make sure that you have that answer too. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To return to the first question, Michelle Bond, to answer about budgetary uh, considerations, does the Cabinet Secretary not agree with me that it's a bit rich for the Tories to top budgets when their proposal to keep tax for the richest cut would have taken 500 million out of our budget, and that pays for an awful lot of medical staff? Yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well, well, of course, Ms Graham is absolutely correct. If uh, the health budget had been reduced by that amount, fortunately, uh, the Parliament took a different view. Uh, but if that had been the case, that is a significant number uh, of additional uh, nurses, doctors, uh, allied health professionals, and so on, all of whom are absolutely critical to delivering uh, the quality of health care that we are committed to as a government and the reduction in waiting times that I've made very clear I intend to see over the next period. Question number two, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on non-medically qualified practitioners providing Botox and other similar treatments. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. For the record, presenting officer, um, I, th I should say that I have a family member who's a qualified beautician. Um, we are currently considering a range of options for phase two of the regulation of independent clinics which focuses on cosmetic procedures, including Botox and dermal fillers, which are provided by non-healthcare professionals within non-regulated sites, principally, although, although not exclusively, administered by beauty therapists and hairdressers. Colin Beattie. Uh, thank the Minister for that answer. Given that sometimes desperate circumstances force people to undergo such risky treatment, can you outline what steps the Scottish Government is taking to improve access to such services on the NHS and to better regulate the industry. Minister. Botox and, inje and injections and other similar procedures are not provided by the NHS for cosmetic rather than medical reasons. In April 2015, the Scottish Cosmetic Intervention Expert Group published a report on regulation of independent health care and its recommendations were accepted by, by ministers. Phase one of the regulations on the 1st of April 2016 focused on independent clinics run by a doctor, dentist, nurse, midwife and dental technician who administer cosmetic procedures such as dermal fillers and lip enhancements drugs like Botox, which is a prescribed drug and are <clears throat> required to be registered with Healthcare Improvement Scotland. 
Question number three, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when the feasibility study on junction improvements on the A84 near Blair Drum and Safari Park will be completed. Mr Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, Transport Scotland commissions its operating company to undertake a feasibility study and outline design for potential improvements at this location. This has taken longer than anticipated as new information in relation to historical accidents came to light during the final evaluation stage. This information is currently being reviewed to consider how this relates to the completion of the study. The Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, Michael Matheson, has asked Transport Scotland officials to ensure that they conclude this report at the earliest opportunity. Dean Lockhart. Uh, I thank the Minister for that response and uh, update. <clears throat> Community representatives first met in December 2017 to discuss options to improve safety in the junction. The feasibility study was meant to appear in summer 2018 but has since faced uh, the delays mentioned by the Minister. Does the Minister share my frustration about the delays to this report and the concerns that local communities have in relation to safety at that junction? Minister. Uh, the first thing I should say is I, I absolutely recognise the uh, strong community interest in this issue. I know this issue Mr Lockhart has raised and indeed uh, Mr Crawford has also raised uh, in, in the course of his work and understand the frustration with any delay when such a key study for a local community and will, uh, as I say, the, the Cabinet Secretary is keen for this to be, uh, the final report to be presented to him as the earliest opportunity and I'm sure he'll be keen to communicate that to Mr Lockhart. And Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. Well, I'm grateful for the information the Minister has provided to Dean Lockhart. I hope the Minister will understand that I'm disappointed it's taken a parliamentary question for this delay to emerge from Transport Scotland. I was informed in October last year that this, this study would be available in a number of weeks. I informed the community of that response. I hope the Minister will also understand there will be considerable frustration within the Blair Drummond community about this delay because they have been gallantly campaigning on this issue of important road safety matter for a number of years. Minister. Um, can, I, can I, presiding officer, absolutely uh, accept the, the concern that Mr Crawford has raised and uh, for what it's worth I apologise to uh, Mr Crawford for the delay in, in the production of the report. It's for the reasons I've explained in my answer to uh, Mr Lockhart and uh, in the initial answer that additional accident data has been presented and I would hope Mr Crawford understand the need to make sure we take that on board and make sure that the final report reflects that if necessary. Uh, but absolutely, um, I'm sorry that that wasn't communicated to Mr Crawford and he's had to wait for this news today. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that Mr Matheson is very keen to uh, make sure that all members who have an interest in this are communicated as soon as possible the final report is produced. Question number four, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the progress of the Neonatal Expenses Fund. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. A mid-year mid evaluation report will be published by the end of this month, with the evaluation of the full year following the end of March being published in autumn 2019. To date, uh, for the first four months of the scheme, uh, £60,000 has been spent helping 435 uh, families during that first four months. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will know my own interest in the operation of the fund because of my experience and the time my daughter spent in a neonatal ward. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary is able to say how the applications to the fund compare with the number of admissions to neonatal or special care wards and whether there's any variation across health boards and that perhaps there are, there are some health boards that need an extra push to make sure um, parents know of this fund. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so I, I can't give Mr Griffin that information at the moment. That will be part of that first full year evaluation, um, which will um, happen at the end of March. And although the publication of that is autumn 2019, I will look specifically at some of that data in advance of publication uh, in order to uh, be able to address those questions. I think there are other areas where we uh, are conscious that improvement is needed. We're looking in particular at the availability and the appropriateness of accommodation uh, for parents uh, in those circumstances and at the quality and the reach of the information being given uh, to parents who should qualify for that kind of support uh, across our health boards and may not uh, uh, be aware of it. So we will look at some of that information in advance of the full year evaluation uh, and uh, I'll make sure that Mr Griffin uh, <coughs> understands what we're looking at, the basis of it and take, obviously take, given his uh, keen interest and indeed his uh, pivotal role in this in the first place, uh, see if there is more that he thinks that we might do. 
Question number five, Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much pupil equity funding has been given to schools in the Glasgow, Maryhill and Springburn constituency. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, schools in the Maryhill and Springburn constituency have been given almost £2.9 million of pupil equity funding in both 2017-18 and 2018-19. In the forthcoming financial year, schools in the constituency will receive over £2.9 million as part of more than £22.3 million allocated to schools across Glasgow. This funding is to be spent at the discretion of head teachers and will continue to the end of this Parliament as part of our commitment to invest £750 million to tackle the poverty-related attainment gap. Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I commend the imaginative use of PEF funds by Chernside Primary School in Milton, in my constituency, where social enterprise high balls low work with students to, provide, to improve physical literacy and build student confidence in a fun way. More importantly, Cabinet Secretary, teachers see improvements in children's readiness to learn. Can I ask how the Scottish Government seeks to disseminate examples of such good practice right across Scotland? And I very much hope the Scottish Government will consider continuing to extend PEF fun funds, not just through the lifetime of this Parliament, but given the success in my constituency and the benefit to my constituents, into the next Parliament also. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, it, um, uh, obviously I, I would love to be in the position to continue the PEF funding into the next Parliament under the leadership of an SNP Government, uh, but we will, um, we will of course, um, the, the public will of course make their choices on that question in 2021. Uh, I do commend Chernside Primary School in uh, Mr Doris's constituency in the Milton area. We've seen a tremendous uh, imagination deployed in the utilisation of pupil equity funding. Uh, the example that Mr Doris cites is a very good one about the way in which schools acknowledge there are barriers to learning that some young people will face and those barriers have to be overcome before they can participate in effective learning. Uh, we uh, look for uh, solid and sound and evidenced examples of good practice and then share them widely through, for example, the regional improvement co uh, collaborative events that are happening this spring. I was at the first one on uh, Tuesday in Murrayfield for the South East Collaborative and we will ensure that on the networks um, such as GLOW uh, there is a, and the National Improvement Hub, there is a wider understanding of the effective ways in which young people's performance can be enhanced as a consequence of the utilisation of pupil equity funding. Question number six, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recent comments by the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, what action it is taking to tackle gender inequality in the practice of medicine? Cabinet Secretary, Jean Freeman. Uh, the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls will this month spotlight on women and girls' health, inviting individuals and communities to provide feedback uh, on women and girls' health-related questions. A summary of that feedback, as I'm sure the member knows, will be published on their website and responses inform future reports to the First Minister. In addition, with the Chief Medical Officer, I will look at how we can strategically, but at pace, focus on necessary improvements in tackling women's health across the NHS. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. That's a very welcome answer from the Cabinet Secretary, and I would certainly want to highlight uh, this month's activities. But is she aware that women's inequality in medicine also includes thyroid patients whose diagnosis and treatment is deeply concerning? And in recognition of that, her colleague, the Minister, wrote to health boards advising them that the government expects T3 to be prescribed where an endocrinologist has initiated it. What can the Cabinet Secretary do about NHS Tayside, who have blatantly ignored the government's letter and only yesterday refused T3 to a patient, have said T3 is non-formulary, which is wrong as it is on the formulary, as I'm sure the, the Cabinet Secretary knows, and have allowed a panel to overrule Question, please, a Ms. specialist please. clinician who's recognised that this woman needs this life-saving medicine. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, the member for raising this with me. Uh, from what she has said, that sounds like a completely unacceptable response from NHS Tayside, and I will ask the Minister uh, to pursue this with them uh, with some urgency in order to resolve the matter so that they follow uh, the guidelines and the clear uh, views that we've expressed to them, as other health boards are doing. Question seven has been withdrawn. Question number eight, Donald Cameron. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve ferry capacity in the Highlands and Islands region. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. 
The Scottish Government remains committed to improving ferry capacity in both the Clyde and Hebrides Ferry Services Network and on the Northern Isles Ferry Services Network to support economic, social and cultural development of our island and remote mainland communities. This Government works closely with ferry operators to try and ensure demands on our ferry services are met and in line with the Vessel Replacement and Deployment Plan, a number of initiatives are being taken forward to ensure that future capacity challenges are met and that ferry services are further developed. Donald Cameron. The Minister may be aware of recent reports that distilleries on Isla have recently raised concerns about ferries that serve that island uh, regarding the available space on vessels, not just for commercial reasons but also because of the vital tourism which the whisky industry brings. What action is the Scottish Government taking to improve the situation on Isla and elsewhere? Uh, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The introduction of the road equivalent tariff has brought significant and continuing benefits to Isla. Uh, the member has indicated, obviously, there's increasing demand on the capacity that serves Isla. We're very much aware of that, and forecast growth in 35% growth in demand from the distilling sector alone will put additional pressure on, on the capacity we have serving Isla. Uh, we have discussed with uh, the Isla Ferry Committee, and uh, Mr. Russell is a local member, uh, and happy to discuss with Mr. Cameron uh, similar issues and how we try and respond to that demand long term. And Isla is, of course, uh, the uh, next uh, location that we're looking to provide a, a new vessel to serve and we've had discussions also with other ferry operators including Western Ferries who've raised interest in that area too. So we are trying to do everything we can to go all options to improve ferry capacity to serve the very important community in Isla and make sure their economic aspirations can be met. And Alistair Allen. The Minister will be aware of the importance of upgrading CalMac's booking system to allow better management of capacity, not least during times of disruption. Is the Minister able to provide an update on progress in this area? Minister. I, I sort of can. Uh, I first of all want to recognise that uh, this was a very important issue, presiding officer, raised by a summit that was chaired by Dr Allen and Newest, and I'm grateful to him for hosting that event uh, last November and I can confirm that this is an area that I've I requested Transport Scotland officials prioritise in their discussions with CalMac and indeed proposals for the introduction of smart ticketing as outlined by CalMac in their tender bid for the Clyde and Hebrides service is currently under discussion with Transport Scotland and I recognise that an updated system could provide significant benefits in terms of communication with customers uh, and also to help with um, different packaging of, of tickets to try and incentivise use of the services. Question number nine, Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Fair Food Transformation Fund will continue to provide funding to community-based organisations beyond the 2019 tranche. Cabinet Secretary Eileen Campbell. Thank you. We are currently undergoing a review of the way in which organisations apply for funding through the Fair Food Transformation Fund and several other communities-related funds. As set out in the draft budget statement, we aim to launch a new single harmonised communities fund uh, this year that will replace several current funding mechanisms, including the Fair Food Transformation Fund. This streamlined apl application process seeks to make things easier for third sector and community organisations, something we know the sector would value and has requested. My officials have been keeping in contact with organisations throughout this review and with those who are interested in applying to the fund and will update them as soon as plans are finalised. Bill Kidd. I uh, thank the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Can the uh, Cabinet Secretary outline what support may be given from the Scottish Government to food banks applying for funding who are looking to develop a wraparound food justice system such as Drumchapel Food Bank in my own constituency who also provide referrals to the health and social care services including mental health and suicide prevention, local money advice services and interaction with local education services where appropriate. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you and I thank Mr Kidd for raising awareness of the incredible work that is going on in his constituency it, because these are exactly the sort of activities that the current Fair Food Fund seeks to support because these are activities which allow access to food in a dignified manner and provides that holistic person-centred support that is clearly the hallmark of Drum Chapel's approach. Uh, and I can confirm that the new Unified Fund will do also endeavour to support that innovative work. But what an absolute pity, presiding officer, to have to deal with increasing levels of food insecurity that only now the UK government has finally conceded down to their uh, appalling rollout of universal credit. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. Before we move on to First Minister's questions, could I invite members to join me in welcoming to our gallery Dr Hassam Zomlot, Palestinian Head of Mission to the UK.